are the twelve deaths of Christmas. My demon souls killed me with a dragon god a punching, other dragon breathing, black phantom smashing, phalanx a spearing, geckos a grouping, vanguards a swinging, man eaters ganking, f gravity. Big old poison swamp, this mine cast golden skeletons and the tower knights say oh he. So, guess who got their hands on a PS5 this year? If you guessed me, you'd be wrong. And honestly, I don't want one yet either. My attitude to new consoles has been pretty consistent since seventh generation. That attitude being, it can wait, usually about three or four years. I didn't play a PS3 till around 2011 and didn't get a PS4 till Christmas 2017. Sure, money's a factor, but the main reason I don't rush to pre-order for a new console generation is because there's bugger all to play on the damn things until about a year or two in. Case in point, there are currently three games releasing on PS5 that are of interest to me. Two of them being Bugsnax and Resident Evil Village, both of which will also be seeing PS4 releases. Now, some of you might say that's not the right way to play them or that I'm robbing myself of the best experience, and to you I say, look at my lovely copies of MGS5 and GTA5 and Wolfenstein New Order on PS3 and shut up. I made my attitude to gatekeeping very clear in my Half-Life review and it hasn't changed in the slightest since. The only real difference between playing Bug Snacks on PS4 and PS5 is about 450 quid because if that's the only reason you've got a PS5 at the moment, then yes, you've essentially paid around 500 quid for one game, and I can't even justify spending 250 quid on Rule of Rose. The only thing that even came close to tempting me to the dark side was the Demon's Souls remake by Bluepoint Games, who also remade Shadow of the Colossus and remastered Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, all games I bloody love. So when I saw the reveal in the PS5 state of play and subsequent gameplay footage, needless to say, the hype was real. For all of about 5 seconds until I remembered I owned and hadn't completed the original. Whew, saved myself a few hundred quid right there. So yeah, now we've seen the release of the ninth console generation ushered in, I suppose I can bring my reviews forward a generation 2, from the PlayStation 2 to the PlayStation 3 era. And really, what could be a better game to bridge that gap than the original Demon's Souls released in 2009? Now while it may not have been the game to popularise or revolutionise the wider gaming landscape, that honour going to its spiritual successor Dark Souls, Demon's Souls comes so close to matching its follow-up that for all intents and purposes, this is in essence the Wolfenstein to Dark Souls' doom. So yeah, anyone going into Demon's Souls from Dark Souls will recognise a lot of the tropes that were actually carried over from Demon to Dark. That being said, there are things that Demon's Souls does differently that may be jarring for people going into this from Dark Souls. For one thing, there's no jumping, but this means there are no areas in the game that require jumping to reach, and let's just put it out there, the jumping mechanics in Dark Souls is cack on toast, so losing it here is only a good thing. What isn't so good is the dodge rolling, because unlike Dark Souls where you can roll in any direction while locked onto an enemy, here you can only roll left, right, forward and back and you really do notice it going backwards from Dark Souls to Demon's Souls and it did get me killed a couple of times. Also ladders. Whether you're going up or down, this is the quickest you can move on ladders and what's even worse is that you can't just press circle to let go and fall. Probably the most tedious part of the whole game and something that I'm glad was changed moving forward. 
The biggest change from the Soulsborne formula, however, is the progression, ditching the pseudo-open world feel for a more linear progression system. Now, instead of a sprawling map that slowly opens up, there are five set worlds, each with its own three bosses, except for World 1 which has four, and there are no more mid-level checkpoints as bonfires have been completely removed as well. Instead, we have arch stones, which only appear when and where a boss has been defeated, meaning that in order to unlock new checkpoints, you have to complete the whole section in including boss in one sitting. Fortunately, you can find and open shortcuts throughout some of the bigger areas to make repeat visits more manageable, but this system is still nearly nowhere near as forgiving as the bonfire system that would replace it. And because there's no bonfire, there's also no Estus flask to refill. Instead, healing items are now consumable in the form of different grasses. This actually makes the game easier though, as these can be farmed to completely break the game, because now instead of being limited to 5 heals, you can have up to 99 per grass type, and considering there's like 5 or so different types, you could enter a boss fight with more healing grass than you'll know what to do with. I'll be honest, I do prefer the Estus in this instance, because late game was missing most of its challenge because of the grasses, so no matter how tough a fight you got into, if there's a window to heal, you're pretty much guaranteed a victory. The biggest mechanical difference though is World Tendency, something wholly unique to Demon Souls. Simply put, World Tendency is a scale in each world ranging from pure white to pure black, determining the difficulty of a given area. Pure white is reached by killing bosses and black phantoms and results in enemies being weaker and doing less damage but dropping less souls and items and exclusive NPCs appearing. Whereas Pure Black World Tendency has stronger enemies that drop more souls and better items along with exclusive black phantoms appearing and is reached by killing NPCs and dying in body form. Which reminds me to mention body form and soul form. When in body form, you have full health and when you die you revert to soul form and you get your health capped at 50%. So body form is the obvious preferable choice, right? Actually, no. As mentioned, dying in body form shifts the world tendency of the area you died in towards black, making the game potentially harder. And also, there's an item you can get in the first area of World 1 that raises your soul form health to 70% max. And with enemies and bosses being able to dish out damage quickly and frequently, the difference between getting hurt with a full bar as opposed to 70% max health is negligible. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into the story here because your level of involvement with the actual plot is entirely up to you. With some NPCs and side quests being entirely missable if you just power through the main game like I did. For the record though, the main plot is about a king who uses an ancient power called Soul Arts to help his kingdom prosper and in doing so awakens an ancient demon called the Old One that invaded his kingdom of Boletaria, filling it with demons and cutting it off from the rest of the world by shrouding it in a wall of fog. You play as a random hero who is just the next in line of many previous fallen heroes who have entered the fog to never return and it's here that our game begins. But first things first, we need to make a character. My advice? Don't bother. The character creator already takes the fun part out of the process by making your character f ugly by default, and you'll spend most of the game covered in armour staring at your avatar's arse anyway. Apparently the game's easier if you go for a magic build, but I'm not sure how true that is. I picked a soldier and I didn't really have any more trouble than I would in any other Souls game, but if it is true then your best option apparently is to choose royalty as your starting class. I say apparently because that's what the wiki says, because like every other Soulsborne title, you'll only spend just over half of your time with Demon Souls actually playing it. The other half of the time will be spent online. And by online, I don't mean in PvP or invasions, because the PS3 Demon's Souls servers are terminated, as I'm reminded every time I start the game. No, when I say online, I mean Fextra Life, or Wikidot, or Vartividya, or Democracy. Because like all Souls games, you'll want to know the best armors and stats for builds and upgrading to your personal playstyle preference, and to make the most of the mechanics the game spends bugger all time telling you about. So yeah, it's about 70% playtime and 30% Google, which means I'm not too sure how to go about covering the actual game progression itself because of what I've just mentioned and if I were to start doing a deep dive into each part of the game from the levels and NPCs to the bosses and the lore, this video would take an extra year to make and would be longer to watch than the Lord of the Rings trilogy theatrical, not extended. Plus there's way better content out there in the Souls community already from people I've mentioned like Varty Vidya that doing so myself would just feel like drawing on the wall in crayon at the Louvre and would probably be just as impactful. So here's what we're gonna do. 
for the most part we're not going to be looking at law or npcs all i'll really be looking at for the rest of the video is the areas bosses and general progression oh and just a quick word on the music as well because it is some of the best orchestral work that gaming has to offer like a cross between holst planet suite and coyone scotsy by way of jerry goldsmith this just manages to hit that sweet spot of variety between upfront bombast and pulled back ambience managing to feel all at once familiar and yet still devoid of any cliche i've even started listening to this soundtrack in my free time while cleaning or catching the bus somewhere so yeah i can't recommend this soundtrack enough anyway some people may still consider the rest of this video to be spoilery in some way so i'm just going to pre-warn you now to go play the game before watching this if you want a fresh experience okay so let's start right at the beginning with the tutorial a mostly simple linear progression letting you know about the game's mechanics such as rolling, blocking and parrying. And for anyone that's familiar with Soulsborne parrying, this is some of the most fluid and user friendly parrying in the whole series right here. Watch this. <laughs> And yeah, that feels as good as it looks. You have a stamina bar that's depleted by attacking, rolling, sprinting and blocking hits and a magic bar that I never use because I always go for up close melee builds and even then usually favour dexterity over brute strength. So across four Souls games over the span of about five or six years, I don't think I've ever cast a single spell. The tutorial level culminates in a one-off boss battle in a small room and is almost a guaranteed loss for most if not all newcomers because you have base character and weapon stats and can't upgrade before this. <laughs> Here's the thing though, not only can this fight be won, but once you know the trick to it, even the most basic of players can turn this boss into a joke. The trick in question? Get in close and keep moving to your left and stick into its right side, i.e. the side it's holding the weapon on. All of its attacks will miss, and the only threat then is the butt smash which has a massive wind up that gives you plenty of time to back up far enough to get out of the area of effect. You still won't do much damage per hit, but you'll do a hell of a lot more than it will to you. once you do beat Vanguard, you'll get to visit this bonus area with some good early game pickups and another boss. Want to know how to beat this one? So either way, whether you beat Vanguard or not, you end up in the Nexus, which I assumed was where those that were killed were transported to, you know, like you were, or was some kind of safe haven or rescue shelter. But the game never really explains it, but if you want to know more lore, again, go look it up. There are some NPCs scattered about, like a blacksmith who can upgrade your weapons and shields using the various stones you find throughout the game, a crestfallen knight who touched the heart of my inner cynic. We're welcome here. As long as we keep slashing up demons. <laughs> and Stockpile Thomas. I'm Stockpile Thomas. Whose role in this is to carry your excess baggage because this game doesn't just have equip burden but item burden as well. So if you're carrying too much you'll be slowed down and won't be able to pick anything else up until you go offload. A mechanic that came back to bite me in the arse a couple of times towards the end of the game when I couldn't grab a one time collectible that despawned when I went to unburden myself. So yeah, not too big a fan of that. Outside of those couple of incidents though, the whole mechanic felt pretty invisible and just pointless because it added nothing to the game except busy work. There is a narrative reason for his part to play in the game. You see, when the demon fog swept in, he abandoned his wife and daughter and fled to the Nexus, and so to atone for the burdens of his sins, he offers to carry the burdens of others. Gripping emotional stuff to be sure, but we're here to die a lot, not cry a lot. And if you are here to cry, then Great Grey Wolf Sif is in the next game. Back in this game, however, there's only one place we can go from here, Boletarian Palace. Yeah. 
yeah, don't be fooled. That's probably the least threatening dragon in the entire Soulsborn catalogue. Boletarian Palace is the perfect introduction to the Souls experience. It starts you off with the same basic enemies from the tutorial, only now they seem a little more aggressive. They have this running lunge attack with this deceptive recovery pose after that baits you into attacking with confidence, but after about a second they launch into a flurry of swipes that can bring your health to nothing while you're still at base stats. And that's the one rule you'll want to apply for the remainder of your time with the game. You rush in, you die. You get nothing from being cocky here but a sword in the face. Aside from that, the game also rewards exploration, usually in the form of an NPC, a rare item, or sometimes, if you're super lucky, a shortcut to help pick back up the pace if and when you do die. And speaking of dying, it's time for the game's first real boss fight. And I say real because this isn't a one-off challenge like Vanguard. This is your first real barrier to progression. There is literally nothing you can do until you beat this boss, which some of you may not on your first few attempts. Which is the trick to all bosses, really, not just in Demon Souls, but across the entire Soulsborne library. See, each boss has a strict set of moves and your task isn't just to smack it till it dies, but to figure out each boss like a puzzle in order to react accordingly, which just reinforces my earlier statement about this game rewarding patience. If you can take the time to learn the boss's attacks, what their attack wind-up telegraphs look like, then you can figure out when's best to be offensive or defensive, and the whole thing feels way more natural than a boss fight where you can only attack during very strict windows. Because you can fight back whenever you want, but depending on your awareness of your surroundings or available stamina, you could be leaving yourself more at risk of retaliation. So, don't be upset if you don't beat a boss on the first try every time. Just try to learn from your mistakes, because 99% of the time it will be your lack of understanding of the dance you have to perform with each boss that will be your undoing. Either way though, give yourself a pat on the back for beating your first boss. This is where shit gets interesting. Now that you've unlocked another archstone, head back to the Nexus and talk to the waifu in black who tells you to go to someone else for an exposition dump. Do this and now we can start levelling up. What is it? Dost thou seek soul power? So be it. After all, thou requirest strength. Go forth, touch the demon inside me. Let these ownerless souls become thine own. So, a quick word on souls for the uninitiated. Across all of the Soulsborne games, you'll collect souls, an all-in-one currency used as both experience points to level up with and as payments for items from different vendors throughout the games. You get these by killing enemies or picking up as items to be consumed at your leisure. Souls are lost upon death but can be recollected if you manage to get back to where you died and pick them up. Die again before you do this though and those souls are gone for good, again encouraging a more cautious playstyle. This means that you can absolutely grind for souls to level up to give yourself an advantage, but really if you've got the patience you'll find that succeeding in the game is more about skill than numbers. Art thou done? May thine strength help the world be mended. Killing bosses also reverts you back to body form, and a trick I found online to avoid changing your world tendency by getting killed and reverting to soul form is to kill yourself in the Nexus. Sure this means you'll be playing the whole game in soul form with reduced max HP, but considering how some of the enemy encounters in this game will melt your health anyway, that's not as big a loss as it sounds. So do yourself a favour every time you beat a boss, head back to the Nexus, run up the two flights of stairs and yeet yourself off the edge before respawning and collecting your souls. Okay, so now we've beaten our first boss and can start exploring and levelling up. And this is where I'm going to get more vague, partly because I don't want to give away what every level has to offer, but also because where you go from here is part of the learning experience and entirely dependent on your skill level and what you want to do or feel comfortable to tackle. Because now all the other arch stones have opened up and you can start exploring the other four worlds. The Stonefang Tunnel, a mining area that starts you off with tough skinned lizard men slaving away with pickaxes, but as you descend deeper into the following arch stones you'll come across giant fire spewing worms and bear bugs, which are like giant mites made out of molten rock that just aren't worth dealing with. 
Next, there's the Terror of Latria, which I feel leans more into the Lovecraftian horror angle, which starts off with these mini Cthulhu looking prison wardens before descending into full on grotesque imagery with gargoyles and monsters which are the results of inhuman experiments, and is probably my favourite level in terms of aesthetics. Level 4 is Shrine of Storms and for new players to the Soul series or even this game this is probably the hardest level in terms of genuine challenge to the point where the bosses in this archstone are all easy and act more as simple rewards for surviving the run up to them. The problem is is that this level starts with skeletons but not just any normal skeletons, rolling skeletons and for anyone that doesn't know skeletons that use rolling as a primary mode of transport are the bane of any Souls player next to poison swamps. The last level has a poison swamp in it. Fuck. For those that will understand, Valley of Defilement is Blight Town. I don't mean it's a prototype or a blueprint, I mean it is Blight Town. You start out navigating precarious wooden walkways and structures dangling over an insta-kill bottomless pit while fending off vagrants and giant bugs before descending into a poison swamp that even has the same blood spewing mosquitoes in it. Oh and a quick note on poison, unlike later games there is no gauge counter to let you know how close you are to being poisoned in order to manage it, you just get a message popping up to tell you you're poisoned. And second though, you also can't sprint or roll in the swamp. Pressing circle to dodge or roll results in you lurching forward like you've just felt gravel in your shoe and holding it takes you from a walk to a normal jogging pace, so have fun with that too. Easily the worst level in the game. But as anyone who's even heard of a Souls game before knows, these games are all about the bosses. These are the bread and butter of the game and the real milestone challenges and are generally where the real struggle lies whether that be in terms of being a genuinely fair challenge or just cheap and broken. Now you have to understand that my experience with the majority of this game came after completing all of the Dark Souls, Bloodborne and Sekiro. Before this when I tried to play I'd only encountered 4 of this game's 18 bosses and they'd all stomped my face into the dirt. But coming back years later I found that these were probably some of the easiest bosses in the series, at least on a mechanical level. Having said that, I'm going to give you a rundown of all the bosses in what I consider to be easiest to hardest based on how many times they killed me throughout New Game and New Game Plus runs. I know this isn't really necessary but one I'd like to get my thoughts out on each of these and I don't want to take up an extra video doing so and two out of all the easiest to hardest lists I've watched I haven't really found any that match my personal experience so I thought I'd just make my own to offer another perspective. I will try wherever possible to consider the challenge each of these may present to new players with no prior souls experience or knowledge but mostly this will be going from my current thoughts on the playthroughs I recorded for this video. Also I know I warned about spoilers already but here's a quick reminder because some of these can be considered lore bosses as in they're mainly there for story purposes and speaking of Surely you have seen for yourself suffering that fills this world. There's no way around this. I can't even call you a bad player if you die to this blob because I know it will have been a deliberate decision to do so because he attacks so slowly and does so little damage that even if he does get a hit in you've got a stupidly massive window to heal back up in and this is the final fight of the entire game. I get that it makes sense in terms of the story and it is appreciated but ultimately I just felt more robbed of a final boss than I did satisfied that I got closure from the story. You are fool. Don't you understand? No one wishes to go on. Two words. Thief ring. Find it in the first area of Boletarian Palace and this fight is an instant win. The old hero is blind and searches for you by sound. The thief ring makes it harder for you to be detected, which for most enemies reduces the aggro range so you can get closer without triggering them into attacking. 
For the old hero, however, this ring makes you invisible to detection, meaning you can just run up behind him and attack freely. Sure, he turns around to retaliate, but this takes so long you've got time to run far enough out of range of his swipe, after which he'll just turn around and continue following his original path. A truly fitting name, as in it's a huge monster covered in flies. Again, getting close and stay behind it and back up when you see it winding up its area of effect attack. It can perform attacks that cover you in flies to drain your health gradually, but even if you didn't know about being able to burn them off with the torches dotted around the edge of the arena, they take away so little health as to just be a non-threat anyway. I'll admit I knew about this boss before going into it myself so I'm going to pay that kindness forward here. Before you even think of taking on the fight, go up to the other tower and kill this dude here, otherwise the boss will just keep infinitely spawning. As for the fight itself, it starts simple but after doing a certain amount of damage she disappears and reappears with clones. Your options? Either kill the clones first before going for the real idol or focus solely on the real one by watching out for her magic attack which is bigger than that of the clones. Just be careful though because every time she comes back she lays down magic traps around the arena which can be a bit annoying on their own but also leave you open to taking a soul arrow or two up the jacksey. Again, another lore boss, and one that can pose a bit more of a challenge, but we're still in the territory of zero deaths over two runs, so make of that what you will. Either snipe Maiden Astraea from a distance with spells or arrows, or face off with Gal Vinland, who I can see being more imposing to more impatient players, but attacks so infrequently that even if he does get a hit in, like true King Alant, you've got more than enough time to heal up. Beat Gal Vinland first, and Astraea won't even fight you and will just choose to die instead. Take your precious demon soul. That's right, we're still in zero death territory here, though again I have Google to thank as there is an option to have an NPC aid you in this fight, and with the thief ring equipped and another target to focus on you may as well be invisible to this guy. I can see it may be being more of a challenge doing it solo, but considering the boss that follows him is also part of the zero death club, I imagine the devs wouldn't have made him more challenging than that. And speak of the devil, here's the old king himself. I'd seen this guy near the top of most people's hardest demon souls bosses and was hyped up for a true battle on the level of Artorius or Bloody Crow of Canehurst. Unfortunately what I got was this slow moving, easy to read telegraph after easy to read telegraph of a boss fight. Sure he can use soul sucker and drain you of actual soul levels, but thing is he never did because he spent 5 minutes with his hand in the air and the reach is so pathetic that I would have been more embarrassed than frustrated if he did get me with it. I'll admit he did get more hits in on the first playthrough than in New Game Plus, but that was only because I was still learning which of his attacks did a horizontal or vertical ranged blast but once I was comfortable he could barely touch me. I'd like to put it down to my prior souls experience, but if I'm being honest with myself, with how much of demon souls I'd have played by this point and how late in the game you're likely to face him, I think he would have been just as much of a pushover had I gone in fresh, and as much as I'd like to say that's just my subjective opinion, the fact that I never died to him is an objective fact. Don't take that as me bragging, because I know I'm far from the best souls player out there. The truth is that old King Galant's fight is just all bark and little to no bite. Yeah. 
I am frankly embarrassed that this tub of lard managed what King Galant couldn't and actually killed me. I have no excuses. I just got stuck in a corner and couldn't get out in the half hour it took for the adjudicator to bring down its blade and finish me off. In reality though, this thing should be up there with the true king in terms of difficulty. Just attack its wound, go around to its bum when it winds up to attack, rinse and repeat until it falls over, then... Attack its weak point for massive damage. Again, like Adjudicator, the deaths here were totally my own fault and are no indication of the boss challenge or quality. Leechmonger is a pushover that will only hurt you if you get greedy. And I got greedy. This one, again, I don't want to put down to boss difficulty or quality, but rather to the game's very restrictive four-way rolling, which wasn't too bad for the most part, but for some reason stuck out like a sore thumb every time I went to fight this red wanker. Mobility is key in this fight, and the fact that you have full 360 freedom of running direction, but only four directions you can roll in, matched with the chairs scattered around the boss arena, makes for a lot of awkward missteps that did the majority of the damage. As mentioned earlier, most of, if not all new Demon Souls players will have fallen at least once to this axe wielding frustration machine, and in terms of deaths it should be way higher on this list. But the thing is, is that once you know how to exploit its blind spot by sticking close and circling round its right side to keep behind it, the fight just becomes an absolute joke that will see you not only not losing every single time, but if you stick to it you more than likely won't even get hit. So, despite the amount of times it has killed me, I just can't justify placing Vanguard any higher on the list because I know it will never kill me again. Again, another lore fight, and a really gimmicky one too. Anyone that managed to beat Vanguard in the tutorial will have already seen it and been sucker punched by this scaly shit, and now it's time for revenge in the form of a sneaking mission? You literally spend the whole fight either hiding behind pillars, attacking stone rubble to clear a path, or firing two giant harpoons. Then it's just a case of finishing the fight with a couple of smacks to the chin horn. This fight sucks, and is only made worse by the amount of hype the boss got in the game's intro. The first boss in this list I'll concede a genuine defeat to in terms of boss quality. If you get greedy or cocky here, you will be overwhelmed and plugged by more giant spears than Riley Reed. Managing your stamina is key here. You can use the turpentine and fire bombs you're likely to find in the first area, but even if you don't, taking this boss's defence apart bit by bit and not rushing will steer you clear of being ganged up on for the most part. This behemoth was my first real roadblock when I tried playing Demon Souls originally. Even after I'd taken out all of the archers around the outside of the arena, I just could not get close enough to Terry Knight to even think about hacking away at his ankles to topple him. As much as I hate the phrase, this is a fight I can unambiguously chalk up to getting good. 
Sure, I still only died once to him in two playthroughs, but that was just good fortune on my part, and if I were to fight him again, even now I'd treat the fight with the respect and caution it deserves. Again, like Terror Knight, if you don't treat this fight with respect, you will get absolutely wrecked. This fiery beast is unrelenting, and while you may have a couple of moments where its AI goes from chess master to potato battery and it'll just sit there or get stuck in a piece of wall, if you don't have your guard up for most of this fight, you're going to have a bad time because this lava gorilla can gain ground very quickly. So all those flying stingrays that have been bugging you through World 4 get their just desserts here. Just run to the other end of the arena, grab the Storm Ruler Sword and wind slash your way to Karmic Retribution. I beat this boss first try in New Game. And speaking of karma, that arrogance came back to bite me hard in New Game Plus and got me killed three times. Tread carefully and the fight is easy, but when the hits land, they land hard and you do well to remember that. A just plain difficult fight. Keep your distance and prepare to get webbed and firebombed. Get in close and say hello to body slams, swipes and this wonderful flame diarrhea move. This boss falls into the rare category of there's nothing wrong with it but I just don't like it. I wish I could understand or explain why but I can't. This fight just always feels like a slog that I know I'm not going to have any fun taking part in. Without a doubt, the hardest boss or bosses in the entire game. Regardless of how good you got, the man-eaters will always have something you don't. The most attention deficit riddle they are known to man. Seriously. Whereas Flame Lurker's pathfinding just made him look a little stupid, the AI of the man-eaters makes them look completely erratic and chaotic. They'll either be unrelenting and leaving you little room for error or healing, or they'll just stand there while you wail on them, or they'll fly off for five minutes, land and then just fly off again. Sure they're stupid as shit, but in this case that stupidity makes them dangerous and unpredictable. Case in point, in New Game Plus the first man eater just kept flying off and spent so long in the air that I didn't land a single hit on it before the second one turned up, and dealing with two at once is just the worst thing imaginable. And that's all the mainline bosses. I know there'll be people that see this list and disagree, and that's fine. Everyone has different play styles. If you have your own opinions on the boss rankings, put it in the comments or maybe even make your own video giving your list. So after going through the game twice and talking about the mechanics, the levels and the bosses, does Demon Souls get a recommendation? Well, yeah, obviously. And that recommendation extends to newcomers and Souls veterans alike. If you like your games with a bit of spice and a fair challenge, Demon Souls has you covered. If you like a unique fantasy world, yep, Demon Souls. If you've gone through all three Dark Souls, Bloodborne and Sekiro, and still want something new to scratch that particular itch, you guessed it, self-flagellation. I mean, Demon Souls. And of course it can't be ignored that this was the game that started it all. Sure, Dark Souls is the game that popularised the style and brought it into the limelight, but we wouldn't have that without Demon Souls, so you've got that game to thank for the slew of imitators like Neo, The Surge, Jedi Fallen Order, Mortal Shell, Code Vein and so on. So whether you grab the PS3 original or are lucky enough to have gotten your hands on a PS5 and the shiny new remake, I really can't recommend this game enough. 
And this may be the easiest game out of the Soulsborne catalogue, but that's like saying that a colonoscopy is easier than an endoscopy. Sure, you'll be able to breathe easy afterwards, but you'll still be coming away with a sore arse. I hope just a quick message to say thank you for checking out the video. If you enjoyed what you saw, feel free to drop a like or maybe even a comment down below sharing your thoughts. And if you do want to see more videos like this, maybe check out one of the videos that are on screen right now or subscribing to keep up to date with all future releases. Even if you don't do any of that though, thank you so much again and have a good one. Cheers.